structure. I still work like that. Whenever I wake up, first thing, even before brushing my teeth, I actually put up what will I do during the day. And I pretty much try to stick to it. I probably strike off close to about 60%. Know very early that there are some things that even if you put those 10,000 hours, you may not get there. Mm, so hence, every stakeholder, whether it is a, whether it is a team member uh, or an investor, or for that matter, anybody looks for four things in life. So uh -huh. what are things that, you know, you believed in strongly, uh -huh. but due to the business and by factor of just being on ground, uh -huh. you've changed your mindset on? Oh, interesting question. I've never been asked this one. Welcome to the Indian Silicon Valley podcast. I'm your host, Jivraj. And today I'm very excited because I have a guest on the show twice, but this guest is extremely special. Join me to welcome Ashish Mohapatra, who's the co-founder of Oxizo and of Business and the CEO of Our Business. Thank you so much, Ashish, for joining me. Incredibly delighted to be hosting you. Thank you for having me the second time again and really enjoyed the first time around. So looking forward. Yeah, no, I think uh, there's so much that has happened since last time, right? Uh, that was about one, one and a half years ago now. And uh, the ecosystem's changed. The business has come such a long way. The We've world's heard changed. The world's changed completely. We are now back in normal, right? Like we're meeting in person. Uh, and so I want to uncover everything in terms of the Delta that's happened. But a very interesting point to start is brilliance and being exceptional at what you do, right? And where I come from is is that in this period, you've also done some very interesting public arrangements. And I've loved how you've spoken about the excellence bit, the ambition, being great at what you do. And this proves in your trajectory, right? Somebody who comes from a small town, but cracks IIT, cracks the big companies, McKinsey, Matrix, you go to an ISB, and now you've so you're sitting here having built a $5 billion plus valuation company and another unicorn. Talk to us about this DNA, right? What does the word exceptional mean for you, brilliant mean for you? And how have you imbibed it? How do you live by it? I think the word exceptional per se, I mean, frankly, when I was a kid, I didn't know the word, right? So the way it started in my case was that um, if you had to do something, you had to be really, really good at it. Mm -hmm. And to first understand how much you have to be good at it, you have to know who's the best at it. Okay. And then after having figured out who's the best at it, if you have this ambition of saying that I'll beat him by leaps and bounds, that's a good starting point. So that's how I uh, approach problems, right? So saying, hey, if I'm starting up something new, let me go through that three-phase process. I mean, obviously, I will not end up there in almost all my pursuits, but if at least the, uh, the pursuit is the same, and the approach is the same, likely, you know, you'll have you results that. sooner than later. Yeah, but no, but there's this thread, right? I mean, almost at everything that you've approached, you've ended up excelling at it. I want to go deeper there and understand, do you think You're too kind, I must say that. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it shows, right? I mean, there is tangible proof and people around me, I mean, the best compliment I've actually heard about you and maybe this deserves public recognition is if there's a new age founder who can build a reliance, it's probably you, right? What do you think works for you the best, right? What is it that you do when approaching a new problem statement that by the end of it, you've mastered it? So to me, I think about five parts and they're very different from each other. Okay. So the first part is around getting people around you. Mm -hmm. And frankly, not really getting the great people around you because that many people can uh, really uh, carry it forward, but getting people who are unskilled and getting them motivated so that they can run for you like crazy. That's when you build a business. If you get, I mean, if you get great people around you, at the end of it, they will, you, you may not end up building a great business because you may lose them. Right. Plus on top of them, you have to pay them and stuff like that, right? So one is getting masses around you and getting them completely motivated towards the goal. It's something I'm good at. That's one. Second thing that I'm good at is discipline. Like, um, I think doing the same thing over and over, over and over again, doesn't tire me. And I look forward to the next time and when the next time comes around I look forward to the next time around so just the very basic discipline and rigor of being at it at it at it even if it bores you I don't care too much so that's second I think the third is energy like uh, I mean all of us have draining uh, schedules just to make sure that you know you have longer hours I don't want to mention any hours because that's a taboo <laughs> right now but but longer hours than what you can do yeah a bit of 20 percent maybe but day in day out is something that I think uh, that uh, it requires the fourth thing that I think is to think differently 
mm-hmm. at a very core level many people actually think of innovation at a superficial level many people think of you know pursuit of excellence at at a very uh, at a very surface level i want to think of something very deep like for example if you look at what we've done in our business um it doesn't probably differentiate at, at a very um, you know customer facing level but at a at a business model or uh, uh, level it really really innovates because it combines two things which were hitherto not done at an institutional level which is financing mm-hmm. and commerce right so uh, so think of innovation at a very very core level is the fourth and i think fifth is uh, just ambition which is what we spoke about yeah uh, when we started so just think of something right like I always say think the unthinkable yeah and unthinkable has to be uh, utopian to begin with so so those are the five elements i would say uh, absolutely no, i think the, all of those five are very interesting that brings me to the point that when i had the first conversation with you i recognized very distinctly that there is a sense of structure in your communication and in your thoughts how deliberate are you to make that happen or does that come with years of practice and eventually this is the output of it see when i was growing up i realized that um, um, you had to pack things in a day right yeah um and the days are finite um you have 24 hours you can do not do you can't devote more than 12 right so to actually cram everything that i wanted to i had diverse interests while growing up and yeah. at one point in time i had more than 12 hobbies right stamp collecting coin collecting yeah. and i was into all kinds of uh, hobbies that a kid gets into yeah. um and didn't master any of them except <laughs> maybe a couple uh so so frankly at that time because there was finite time in the day and so many things had to be crammed in i realized that uh, a very basic process of actually putting in an order through the day is important so yeah. i began with saying hey uh, this is like let's say these are my 12 hours in the day and with 2 hours of breaks in between these are my 14 hours in the day i'll do this as number 1 number 2 number 3 number 4 and that order actually pretty much was the beginning of structure i still work like that whenever i wake up first thing even before brushing my teeth i actually put up what will i do during the day and i pretty much try to stick to it i probably strike off close to about 60% and that order was the beginning of structure and soon i realized hey it has its own advantages yeah, yeah if you actually think in number 1 2 3 4 it helps you in class as well uh, in academics it helps you in um, uh, in professional life as well and soon i realized that if the two flows from one then it's great communication because when you tell stories in the way wherein you tell one two three four and two flows from one three flows from two people understand it better absolutely uh, and then i soon realized that hey you know what if people understand better they want to hear more of it better and they then get connected to you they they probably uh, do the stuff that you want them to do and stuff like that and that's how i think the journey started it was just basic to do list to begin with yeah. uh, as the first uh, objective which kind of evolved and when i landed up in mckinsey i realized that this is actually called structuring <laughs> yes. and uh, it's there's something called governing thought there is something called you know pyramid principle of communication and that that was just that <laughs> it was serendipity but yes uh, that's yeah. how it was but it manifests itself in different ways right it's so easily adaptable for the audience watching even for a host i can just understand your ideas very sublime we well um the other aspect right and before we go to the business is do you think it's possible to templateize an outlier founder right uh, is that something that you've thought about and considering that at least according to business metrics you can be considered one do you feel there is a template you can put on it if yes what is that template if no why not i think there's a template okay i think there are a few things that almost every uh, person who's actually in the pursuit of excellence and has reached the pinnacle always has and there are i i mean obviously everybody is different from each other in in a few aspects but i think the core principles are pretty much the same right the first core principle i would say is intensity okay the intensity with which one thinks executes um builds teams and stuff like that but basic intensity you know when they're doing something they're really 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 into it that's what uh, i would say the second thing is the amount of knowledge a person has about the field now it may not be knowledge at the beginning of the pursuit but the knowledge that he acquires if he if he started with less knowledge but the speed of knowledge or the acceleration of knowledge acquisition during the course of the journey actually separates the great ones from the good i would say the third one is the ability to build teams actually t- building teams according to me is not about attracting and retaining talent but about actually getting people who are really young who are really moldable who who have the hunger and making them uh, molded 
as per their own skill and as per the opportunity that you have created for them. So I think that's the third. The fourth uh, template that I would say is great selling skills. Yeah. Uh, selling skills is something like, I mean, frankly, a uh, 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 founder is supposed to sell all the time. Uh, and hence, I believe that um, people may have methods of selling, right? Somebody's a good product seller, somebody's a good storyteller, somebody's a... Uh, somebody is likely doing it with communication flair, you know, as oratory skills, but, but selling skills are important. I think that's four. The fifth thing that I have seen, and, and may not be 100%, but mo most of them have it, is, is flair in communication. Mm -hmm. I think so that, you know, so that when I, when I speak, if you listen, uh, it's an important ingredient because I have to speak all the time, mm -hmm. right? So I, I would say those are the five key uh, points that I have seen most of the great yeah. founders actually have. Yeah. 80% of the founders will have it, I'm guessing, right? That, that, way, that yeah. defines it. Yep. No, that's that's amazing. I think if I correlate to the 140 founders I've now had the privilege of hosting and being on the other side of, I think I can map most of these traits to some founder or the other, and then there's a shining factor that each has probably. Lovely. I think this 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 is an interesting point, right? I wanted to start off abstract and maybe now go specific. Um, when we spoke, uh, the company had just become a unicorn, right? And since then, valuations have you know uh, grown multiple x, and the business has come a long way. Tell us how have you navigated this challenging environment? Also, people talk about funding winter, etc. But the business had grown. You've grown employees. There's been growth. How have you tackled it on a company level and what do you think is happening on a macro level? Right. So, see, macro things have changed, right? So, I think in the last, uh, we spoke year and a half back, I think the big things that have changed are three. The first thing that has changed is um, there is a funding equity winter. So, everybody was smart enough. Whoever was smart enough was greatly smart enough to actually raise during that time, right? So, so most of us have actually raised uh, and hence likely don't need the money too aggressively right now. So, that's one. I would say the second thing that has happened is there is a global economic slowdown that has been talked about because a lot of industries actually grew more than what they should have during COVID. Mm -hmm. And all of them have come crashing. The interest rates are, uh, are for example, in, in, uh, in the US have risen. And hence, a lot of industries have taken flag. So there's a global economic slowdown that we are facing. And the third thing that we've seen is, uh, is that uh, in particularly in industries that we are present in or in industries that are much more core to the economy, the prices have really, really crashed. The material prices of anything that you pick up, whether it is textile stuff that you're wearing, whether it is plastic, whether it is uh, um, oil and gas, whether it is metals, prices have really, really crashed. So hence there are effects on the balance sheet and PNL to speak about. So, so those are the three things that have really happened. But I think the big thing here, and every crisis is an opportunity in some way, the big thing here is that people who will tide over these three and the ones that who will really, really come out are the ones who will, um, who will really swing it, right? So just to tell you, I mean, everybody knows this, the big story is that out of the 1930s depression, we got Walt Disney. Yeah. Out of the 2008-9 meltdown, we got Bajaj Finance, right? So there are I mean, many other stories. Airbnb came out of that crisis as well and stuff oh, like that. Airbnb, so I think yeah. this is the time where business models will really get tested. This yeah. is the time where team um, organization structures, unity and all that will get tested as well. This is the time when I think your ability to, to navigate through crisis in general will get tested. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so we've been through that uh, navigation as well. So, I mean, to give you a sense, I think pre-COVID, if we were growing by about 250 to 300% on each of our business verticals, last year we grew by about 100 to 120%, right? Mm -hmm. But still, it's, I mean, it, the numbers look larger relatively, yeah. but the reality is that uh, on a volume growth, the numbers were still very high. So. Exactly. So what have we done? I think the I mentioned one, which is we raised when uh, when the, <laughs> the time uh, was right. when the time was right. So that was one. And the second thing that we did is we are very people focused when it come when it comes to an organization. Yeah. So um, whenever uh, you know we've had crisis, we've kind of called everyone who's within the company to get along and uh, pull up their socks the most uh, than when uh, you know when it's. Uh, when times are great. So I think we focused a lot on people, we focused on retention a lot, we focused on empowering people at the ground level a lot, because um, there are things that uh, 
that we've pulled off in the last uh, pulled off in the last one and a half years which we had not done in the beginning of our journey and it's all come from people down the line like for yeah. example we've now gone into manufacturing we've gone into processing we've gone into packaging pure, we were a pure aggregation platform to begin with on the commerce side in the financial services side now we are a much more holistic financial services player we were initially just financing but now we are into other forms of financial services like debt syndication bond structuring a bit of wealth management and stuff so um, so we've got into newer stuff most of these are led by people who are young people who've spent a lot of time in the company have uh, with homegrown talent uh, so that's the i would say the first big change that we've done that we've driven a lot of new initiatives with young people the second thing that we've done is that we've stuck to our core values our core values irrespective of the business are straightforward first it has to be profitable right from the word go uh, second it has to be bigger in scale right from the word go you cannot yeah. expect it to you know be profitable or large in scale after 2 years it never it never right. is it has to be within 2 months the third thing that we've stuck through is that the business has to be very very clean uh, not just from a statutory standpoint that many companies achieve but from a governance standpoint from a corporate governance standpoint meaning that if you've promised to your ecosystem anything you'll have to stick to that yeah. so i think that's the third core value and fourth core value is to chase for growth and we believe that the fourth core value hence is an outcome of the first three so sticking to that core innovating with young and new people getting into newer business streams is what we've done and that kind of has sustained the growth during these tough times because um, otherwise if you look at relatively what we've done with respect to what others have done i think um, we would be streets ahead mm -hmm. immodestly so absolutely you know i think there are numbers to prove it and there is qualitative evidence as well so kudos to everything that's happening let's double click on the profitability bit right and this is a song that you've been singing since inception however it's a new one for the ecosystem only comes when uh, the funding winter it has stuck it was stuck. a fad to begin with yes <laughs> yes so uh, how, i remember a, a young vc telling me in my beginning days that hey if you are thinking about 0.2% 0.3% pat and all that <laughs> you're talking like a banya you talk like my you know granddad Wow. and my granddad is well passed so yeah so, so it's the fashion now no exactly sometimes old values last long yes um uh, and in fact in our conversation also you called yourself the chief profitability officer yeah, yeah, we spoke about profitability yeah. as well particularly right. uh, what i'd love to know from you is now that you've seen the ecosystem around you you've been here for a while 10 15 years combined vc right. plus founder why do you think that happens right and why do you think the tide changes everybody's voice changes as per the tide while you have stood the test of time why so do you think the question is why have i stood the test of time or why do people why, change why do you stay constant to your belief vis-a-vis -vis what the ecosystem says and why does the ecosystem only say it when it's necessary and not all the time oh okay so i'll tell you first why i stay so i think i am a man of who uh, uh, i was born as i was a man of my upbringing and i believe that my greatest chances of su success is when i am myself right yeah. um so i want to be the way i am when i was born up uh, you know one of the biggest first inspirations for profitability was my mom uh, who was a professor in uh, physics she used to say that hey if i've saved money at the end of the month that's profit for us right yeah. i mean, are, I mean nobody's done business either on my maternal or my paternal side right so so i think um I think just that saving mindset translating mm -hmm. to profitability for a uh, institution is something that that is very core to me. Other values that I talk about whether it is young talent uh, molding them that also has seen a change. People used to talk about it taking industry experts ca catch them ground uh, bring them and they'll catch the ground running and stuff that also has changed right. So I think just those core values with which i was born i saw them to be real i saw them that when i'm i was sticking to them i was being more successful is the reason that i stay who i am right and i i wouldn't change even if the world changes because frankly i don't know anybody else i mm. better than myself yeah right so why does the world change i think it's a function of times uh, when money is uh, really really cheap and um, you know uh, and abundant and available what happens is people chase growth and when the money is not there you'll have to generate the money from somewhere and hence profitability comes into fashion i think mm -hmm. that's how financial markets are that's how uh, economic uh, cycles are and hence the world flows in cycles in in ebbs and flows uh, mm -hmm. but uh, there are a few things that uh, that you just can't change i mean i i would love to do uh, love to be that i i've tried to be that in the past yeah. and um, and i've been a miserable failure at it so i've always <laughs> come back to saying hey let me get back to the core of who i am <laughs> yes 
No, that's that's interesting to know. Are there any other value systems? I, that's that's interesting to know. Are there any other value systems that are not very natural to the broader world? Oh, there, there are many. Please tell us. Okay, so um, I think the first uh, thing that comes very naturally to me is liberty, equality, fraternity. Hmm. I read that very early in life. I actually remember where I read it. So I was a collector of stamps. Hmm. Uh, I mean, uh, I've collected more than ninety thousand stamps from when I was five. And one of the first stamps that I collected was the was a U.S. postage stamp with Abraham Lincoln on it, and it hmm. used to say "Liberty, Equality, Fraternity." Right. Yeah. So before I actually got to know some common words <laughs> and their meanings, I actually inquired. I, this was in IIT Kharagpur when I was a kid. My mom and dad were doing their PhD. I went to the professor next door and told him, hey, "Can you tell me what is liberty, equality, fraternity?" Because it's my first stamp. Yeah. Um, um, I'll be a great stamp collector. You know, thinking big. Yeah. Um, so he explained it to me, and the idea seemed uh, uh, wonderful. He told me that it's there in every constitution. I didn't understand what constitution meant. He said that's the holy book of the nation. Okay. Like the holy book of the religion yeah. is uh, either a Quran or a Gita or a Granth Sahib. Yeah. Uh, the holy book of nation is the is the preamble to the constitution. It's there in the preamble of Indian constitution. It's there in in the French constitution. It's there everywhere. I said, okay, those are those are important <laughs> words to learn. And uh, frankly, yeah. they they make so much sense to me that whenever I see something, whenever I see people who are being treated equal, I think that oh, liberty, equality, fraternity. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, uh, those values have really, really stayed with me. I mean, to the point that I remember that when we started the company, I said, let's come in uniforms <laughs> so that you know, everybody seems yeah. equal because I had seen that in a factory. But yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's one thing. And I believe that if you can really live to the values of liberty, equality, fraternity, what will happen is that real young guys, people who are not so privileged will, uh, will really uh, swing it for you. And that's how the business is made. So that's one core value. I think that the, the second core value is this uh, thing that I read much later, and it was you know articulated a lot better by the writer, is the 10,000 hour rule, hmm. right? Which means that if you're doing something over and over and over again, whether you have the talent for it, whether you have the passion for it, whether you really are good at it, you yeah. will essentially go, become good at it. Yeah. I'll give you an example, right? So, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I, re I realized uh, very early, when I was like eight or nine, that somebody had to be, I mean, one had to be good at some form of performing arts hmm. to be really, you know, yeah, to, yeah. to really to be, be entertaining, presentable. to yeah, be yeah. presentable, yeah, to presentable is very, very to minimal, out. to stand out, yeah. <laughs> yeah, stand out is the right word. <laughs> so then what I realized is what performing arts should I get into? Mm. Okay, it was know, poetry. Yeah, that was poetry. Yeah. And I wasn't good at poetry <laughs> at all. When I, when I started putting my pen to paper, I yeah. realized, hey, you know what? I just can't rhyme. <laughs> and then for for a couple of years, I remember till I was in class 11 or, uh, sorry, uh, till I was 11 or 12, I used to just rhyme. Rhyme, 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 rhyme. And one day I realized that I really write good poetry. <laughs> <laughs> and then it soon struck me that if you do keep on doing something, something. for mm -hmm. long, 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 long hours, you kind of become good at it. I actually saw that a, a little later as well. I remember preparing for my JE. Uh, and I was very poor in uh, chemistry, right? Because I just didn't like it. <laughs> but people told me, hey, if you fail in one subject, you won't make it. Yeah. So I just kept doing, 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 doing. I think that's the subject that I studied the most when I was in 11th and 12th, because I wasn't good at it, right? Yeah. And I, was pre I ended up being pretty good. And then yeah. I realized when I read this book, it had the 10,000 hour rule. It was yeah. so intuitive. <laughs> I said, okay, I should have written the book along my back yeah. before. I think that's the second. In business, isn't that a counterintuitive rule though? Because we're taught to take up new challenges, new projects, go excel in another. Isn't this more valid for maybe like a creative arts? Oh, uh, i not so sure. Even in business, I think if you stick to our core values and you think that you are after the pursuit of that value, then you're probably sticking mm. to 10,000 hours rule. So if I'm saying I, am, I have spent probably 20,000 hours chasing profit, yeah. I'll build a business that is profitable. So maybe so the horizontal skills, values which are applicable. Uh -huh. So they're, they're mm. probably not in-depth skills and here yeah. you may be chasing values. Maybe yeah. you're chasing scale. You build great, big, large companies. Right? So, uh, so I think it manifests in different ways yeah. but the core values still remain the same. And there are a few yeah. more as well if you're interested but I don't think <laughs> it'll be great reading for the audience but these two, yes. Yeah. Uh, no, that's very interesting. I'll probably take a segue and you've spoken 
you know a bunch about your early childhood as well right, right. your be it your fascination for numbers stamps yeah. you just spoke about poetry do you think a sense of outlier traits can be identified early on in life and it correlates back to childhood curiosity other things yeah so i think it can be it can be i think if a parent and now i'm a parent right so if a parent actually is not into a questioning mode Mm. and says that hey you know what my kid is doing this and it's probably wrong if you don't take that mindset but say that my kid is doing this and this is probably what he or she will excel in mm. because he or she is doing it anyways without being prompted and you try to see value in it is if they, if you change that mindset right so for example if i'm playing a lot as a kid right my my when my father comes and tells me hey you know what you're not good in your studies and the basic reason for that is that you're playing a lot mm. if you're in, a, in that questioning mode versus saying that hey you're playing a lot are you really interested because a career can be made out there now let me build on what you're doing right so i think if you can take that mindset early in life it obviously needs you to be in a very different frame of mind to take that kind of a risk because it sounds like a risk begin in the beginning uh, you can really uh, i i think every kid is an outlier every man is an outlier everybody can be an outlier they are just forced to do different different things which deviates them from the 10000 hour rule because of the circumstances that they are in but mm. if somebody imbibes that rule from the very beginning and says hey you know what i will spot that early in life and back it because everything has an opportunity at the end of the day so the answer to your question very interesting that's that's a very that's food for thought in terms of perspective um coming to the point where you know you have a lot of these principles i'd love to know some principles that you've changed your mind on so uh. what are things that you know you believed in strongly uh. but due to the business and by factor of just being on ground uh. you've changed your mindset on ah oh, interesting question i've never been asked this one <laughs> so what have i changed my mind on i think one big thing that i have changed on is that initially i used to believe I mean I would say for the first 20 years of my life that I put my heart and soul not just me but anybody puts their heart and soul into it they'll get to the best of it we discussed that right yeah. but now I have come to realize that 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 may not be the efficient way because if you're trying to build an institution you require very many skills mm -hmm. and hence your ability to actually become the best of each skill that is required to build that an institution is is finite and hence you have to actually know very early that there are some things that even if you put those 10000 hours you may not get there mm, so hence um how do you evaluate that thing uh little subjective yeah right um i think in the beginning of those 10000 hours maybe when you're done with 2000 hours 3000 hours and you're measuring that intuitively and you're seeing that the trajectory is not as good as what you have achieved when you got to the 10000 hours where you really achieved you will really know by yourself like it's like mm. a kid playing cricket right and trying it's to learn intuitive. cricket he has been there for like 6 months at but still he is not great in defense he should know that hey you know what i yeah. may get there but maybe after 20000 hours and that's inefficient mm. and that kind of has streamed inside me that hey you know what it is better to hire certain skills it is mm. better to look for some skills in a partner like mm. i'll tell you one um uh, my way better half in both personal and professional life one who's been on your show ruchi kalra she's great at attention to detail great mm. i mean she can actually find out stuff that no human or even <laughs> eagle eye can right wow. in in general yeah. right and hence when it whenever it comes to that uh, i don't pride myself in the fact i just say that hey you 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 are too good at it let me not let me not go there yeah. it's not that i've not attempted but i i whenever i've attempted i've been a miserable failure at it there are yeah. other skills she brings to the fore where i believe the same so so those are skills in a partner Mm. there could be other skills that you hire within uh, team members of yours so right. that one thing is where i have really evolved now i don't believe so much in the 10000 hour rule because i think all the 10000 hours skills that i had to attain i've already attained now let me look <laughs> look for it in others got it i think that's that talks about judgment right having that sense of judgment ki even if i spend these 10000 hours judgment and being objective at it yeah because people don't want to admit to themselves that they are trying but they may not get there that's a big big call to take on yourself right it just right. seems very insulting to yourself yeah. that hey i'm trying and i've really tried but i'll not get there let me dump it and look for it in someone else absolutely super interesting awesome one thing that for me comes to mind and this is borrowed right so i'll double click on that on shantanu's episode you mentioned shantanu this shantanu deshpande barber yes, shop the barber shop uh, you mentioned um, this intuitive yet counterintuitive thing 
about measuring short term really well and not taking too long an outlook to each thing because yes. that helps you get complacent very counter intuitive yes. yeah yeah talk i get questioned us. on that a lot <laughs> yes talk to us about that especially as a founder of a reasonably large enterprise when your day to day entails completing the quarter on quarter targets while your job with the context that you have is to constantly look at the long term how do you manage this in the org and what is the you know genesis of this principle in your head so i am not long term let me put it this way okay because i realized very early in life that that's uh, uh, that's too big a risk to be taken because i remember when i started my professional life with itc okay i was a manager of close to about 35 40 odd uh, fitters these were mechanics on uh, mechanical uh, machines right um, so whenever i used to tell them and i was a fresh uh, grad right i used to tell them hey why don't we do this and this will be good for the life of the machine okay they uh, i realize they they never used to do the breakdown maintenance and they used to only go after that long term work so i i remember thinking about that hey why the, why are these guys doing it because i realized that waiting out for the long term is actually comfortable for the people uh, for the people out there for delivering in the short term they have to do hard work Yeah. and then it kind of compounded in my head that you know in my itc you got that right so there were yeah, fitters yeah. out there who were working more for preventive maintenance and cleaning procedures than attending to an immediate breakdown because yeah, they were yeah. saying yeah, so boss <laughs> told us to work on the long term right yeah serves as a good excuse to ignore the short term good excuse to ignore the short term and then something come, came on my um, um, lap i remember leading a project called kaizen okay in the same factory okay where the same fitters were with me and kaizen was about uh, Uh, continuous improvement kaizen 5s we did everything together okay. so there was something called continuous improvement and that the principle of continuous improvement is very simple it says that if you compound yeah. daily by you even reach. a small fraction but you have the discipline that you are compounding by the at least that fraction every single day then you compound a big deal yeah then i it kind of by while uh, re- reading some uh, manuscripts around that it struck me that hey what uh, if we are compounding okay daily then we will probably reach a much bigger long term than what has been laid out for us yeah then the problem of solving for the long term doesn't, doesn't is exist. not a question at all because you are already solving for it compounding takes care of it ha huh. so what does compounding that now entail compounding now entails first bringing the long term down to shorter intervals which are achievable Right. and measurable so that you are not exposed to natural variances yeah. and the second thing is to have the discipline of saying that hey today i failed now have to more than cover up the next time around yeah so my life is all about that i actually when i am in the current month i only look at the current month at best the yeah. next month but never the month after next yeah. if i am in the current quarter i just look at the current quarter i never go to the next quarter because for me longer the intervals the more the excuses can you you can make in the short term and hence you lose the discipline of execution rigor so whenever mm. i am there i actually evaluate myself daily mm. you know uh, i remember when i was young and i wanted to make money like many youngsters do i used to actually maintain my balance sheet and pnl daily wow or daily not that <laughs> i had short term targets and i met them but i thought just the rigor of actually measuring yourself daily yeah forces you to compound because every day you want to improve mm. and that kind of takes care of any other long term goal that will be laid out in front of you so mm-hmm. um, i know it's counter intuitive it probably puts a lot of pressure on the system it uh, probably is against a lot of management principles because youngsters go and read all these strategic <laughs> long term things and then come and hear this from me and then say that hey you know what you you just want to kill us mm-hmm. i tell them that hey you know why don't you practice for a little bit and let's see we will <laughs> talk about that after you, after you do that yeah but it's something i'm very very uh, close to and i've seen success with just quickly double clicking i understand why this works for execution however considering that you probably have the most context in the organization because you've you know germinated the idea you've got people together etc do you lose out on the advantage that you have of thinking long term because of the context that you have is that ever a trade off that you have to make because you are focused on the immediate so i see run? the merit in that it's just not me so okay. the way i think about it is that if we are compounding at the end of the day somebody in the organization will directionally figure it out will directionally figure it out will add some level of innovation because mm-hmm. i will tell you very honestly what we do today is, is obviously quite different from what we started off with because it has evolved but 10% of that ideation has been me mm-hmm. 90% of that is has come org. from from the org and i would say i would put a gun to my head if you put a gun to my head i would say 50% has come from the founders 50% from non founders mm-hmm. and if you really really ask me i think 
more than 30 to 40 percent would have come from people really down the line. Mm. So I think the direction of what can be innovative and what can really change the long term can, uh, can and should come from the org. Come from the org, not you. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe that you know surpasses the assumption that the founders need to hold the responsibility of always shaping the long run. Absolutely. If the right. org is such where Absolutely you can right. shape the future of the org as a org, not founder led. Like, Very for example, I will tell you that uh, all these, I was talking about these fee income kind of services to you just before we started, or maybe just in the beginning of the podcast. We have started a lot of fee income services on top of financing. Hmm. It actually came from uh, one of our first batch uh, uh, trainees who now leads that business. Um, if Thank you look you. at uh, the entire idea of us getting into manufacturing, it actually came from somebody within the org who actually leads that business today. Lovely. So... Uh, uh, and kudos to them. And I think the, uh, the, uh, the reality is, as a founder, you don't really see things from that uh, vantage point that you have. Mm. Whereas people who are a little bit down the line probably have the advantage of seeing both the strategic point of view as well as uh, the things on ground. Yeah. We've evolved like that. I see merit to what you're saying. I'm yeah. pretty sure some orgs do it uh, in a different way. Yeah. But I just find this a lot more uh, adrenaline rushing. <laughs> Got it. No, very interesting. I think interesting approach to how to build a business, especially at this scale. Um, you spoke about the business evolving, right? And it's interesting. I asked you very briefly, uh, and it's fascinating how I have at least not in public heard you talk about the intricacies of what you do. And you've gone on record to say that this is an unsexy business. This is not very intuitive. I don't want people to do it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I think it's catching on now. Everybody wants to now do the unsexy. Uh, but it's funny, what about that is actually not as intuitive has not been spoken, right? So if I had to put you on the spot and maybe you had to give us like a 101 on all that that happens on the background, right? To make things possible on the front end for the customer, right? If you had to give us an econ 101, this is the business, this is our business model, this is what we do to achieve this, this is the demand side, this is the supply side. Why don't you tell us? Yeah, with the pretext of the fact that I, I may get boring. So, <laughs> um, our business was designed for SMEs. Okay. SMEs are small and medium enterprises. People who are not large corporates. People who are not very small, like mm -hmm. the micro guys, right? So, let's say people with turnover between, or organizations with turnover between, 10 crores to 1,000 crores. Our business was designed for that. Our business was designed for the commanding heights of the economy, meaning people who are either manufacturers or infrastructure service providers, not the distributors, not the retailers, not the IT guys and all that, who are not the commanding heights of the economy to begin with. So real core economy. Having said that, if you look at this sector, it faces three specific problems. The first problem that it faces is that of buying power because most of manufacturers and infrastructure service providers have to buy raw material. Right. Now, most of these guys are small. 10 to 1,000 crores is small. So, hence, they do not have the volumes to actually buy from where it is sourced from, either mm -hmm. a manufacturer or maybe an import source or from the mine, mountain, field and sea. So, they don't, they don't have the buying power and they also do not have the power to buy on advance. Hence, they tend to buy from intermediaries and hence there are lots of intermediaries in that chain. Mm -hmm. And because there are lots of intermediaries in the chain and because of the fact that there is no pricing tag to raw materials, what happens is that generally pricing discovery is a problem. So, what happens is that a lot of IRR gets loaded onto the supply chain. So, that's one buying power okay, okay. for this 10 to 1000 crore kind of guys. The second problem that we wanted to solve for was working capital because fundamentally in buying of in B2B commerce, what happens is that you buy on a credit term. You do not pay on advance. You do not do cash and carry. 99% of the business is on credit. Now, because it is on credit, what happens is a working capital comes in. Somebody has to fund that working capital. Now, banks for these relatively smaller guys, the guys who are between 10 to 1000 crores, are only relevant to the extent of 25 to 30%, which means that the same guys you are buying from the intermediaries, those are the ones who provide credit and hence they charge a bomb for it because it's not institutional credit in any way and hence a lot of price again gets loaded to the supply chain the third problem with these guys is that they are a prisoner of their own ecosystem when it comes to business development which means that they work with the same set of guys as mm. customers over and over and over again and don't really look at newer sources of revenue mm. 
that's a SME and the problems that he engages with on a daily basis. We said, okay, let's build a SME network that solves for all these three problems. Because then you're building a network wherein a lot of people can get advantage from it and every new entrant not only helps himself, but everybody else also currently in the ecosystem. So we built a solution which was three-pronged and hence it became three businesses. Everybody knows us as two businesses, we are actually three businesses because we solve those three businesses, three problems independently. So the first problem, which was about buying power, we said, okay, we will become this one large intermediary wherein we pick up material from the source, from the yeah. manufacturer, and give it directly to the SME who has to use it. We'll bypass all these intermediaries in between. Mm. Sometimes there are two intermediaries, sometimes there are five, sometimes yeah. there are seven. You take those out and you, you basically make a saving in the supply chain, you keep some for yourself, and you give something to the SME. As long as you're keeping something for yourself, you're profitable, because you keep more than what you expend. So that was a very simple model, and this is what our business is today. There were certain segments in which we branched out to, which I'll come back to later. Sure. Now, if you go to working capital financing, we realize that, hey, you know what? The banks do not provide credit because one, they look for collateral, and second, they net out the creditors because anyways, the trade is giving you credit, why should the bank fund it? Yeah. We, we went and said, we will actually not replace the bank, but we will, we will replace the, the creditor, creditor on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. We said we will operate like a creditor. We will give you a credit card against which you can do purchases and those purchases will be for buying of raw material. Mm -hmm. Initially, it was just for off business, but slowly over a period of time, off business is only 10% of what Oxizo is today. But that's how Oxizo was born. Oxizo said, okay, you're buying material out there. I will finance raw material purchases. Not just what you're buying from off business, but what you buy in general. Mm -hmm. That became our second solution, became Oxizo. Over a period of st uh, time, it has started doing other stuff, but the core is still the same. Yeah. similar to what our business is. The third problem, which was this problem of business development in, and uh, uh, you know, pr being a prisoner of it, uh, of your own ecosystem, we developed a solution called Bid Assist. Now what Bid Assist does is very simplistic. What it says is that if you look at our kind of customers, the 10 to 1000 kind of customers, they have revenue from two sources. One, public sources, like government itself, like government-owned companies, Indian Oil, ONGC, Gale, um, or government-owned authorities, like National Highway Authority, Airport Authority, and stuff like that, right? So one is government, the other is private. If you have to, everybody tries to get a bit of government work because the margins are relatively higher, but not cleaner. Mm -hmm. So they maintain some ratio of their business unit, maybe 20 to 40%, right? For that, they have to get into tenders. Now, tenders are voluminous and non-standardized. Close mm -hmm. to 18 to 19,000 tenders get released in a day in India, in wow. a day. Right? Imagine the plight of a SME trying to sift through all that data. We said, okay, what we'll do is we will sift through all that data, make it a very AI-oriented platform, make it available to you at a finger clip, depending on what data you leave about yourself, right? Uh, and we will get give, curated tenders. I'll give you curated tenders, I will give you mm -hmm. the percentage probability of you winning it, I'll give you matchmaking services. If you are not relevant enough for the tender, I'll tell you who you can partner with from the ecosystem. So that became a marketing service for them, but it became a customer acquisition tool for us. Yeah. So these three elements are uh, how we function as a business. The first company is off-business, the third company is bid assist, and the second company is Oxizo. Now in off-business, over a period of time, we realized that, hey, you know what, there are some things that are needed in the marketplace where the suppliers are not good enough, or mm -hmm. they don't want to invest enough, they're not growing with you. Mm -hmm. In that case, we started doing that stuff on our own. And that became the private label on our uh, platform. If you look at Oxizo, they were doing financing through that material purchase financing. They said, okay, why can't we finance other things as long as he's my, already my customer? Right. So they got into other forms of financing. The core still remains raw material financing, which is close to what 80% of what they do, but they've now got into other forms of financing. Now then yeah. they soon realized over a period of time, hey, you know what, my customer also needs other financial services. Why don't I go and give that as long as he's my customer? Because you have to build profitably. You're not acquiring for a new service, right? Yeah. And that became Oxizo, which is a separate business in itself. And bid assist over a period of time now said, okay, well, I will give you ERP solutions, CRM solutions. You are anyways my customer. Why don't you use it for free? And it's a freemium model. So that became a service of its own. So that's how we are designed. Each of these businesses feed off each other. They work on pretty much the same 10 to 1,000 uh, crore guy. They pretty much serve throughout his balance sheet and PNL, I am a very dhanda kind of guy, right? So for me, there's a balance sheet, there's a PNL, and there's a cash flow. So either you solve for your customer's balance sheet, or okay. you solve for his PNL, or you solve for his uh, cash, cash flow, flow, right? So the businesses are designed such that they actually work through the financial statements of the customer. Mm. So mm. that's your one-on-one -on, -one on who you are. Uh, yeah. 
Any that's questions very fascinating. I think uh, for me also with all the research that I came in, there is new information that I've had to grasp. So that is wonderful. And goes to show the ecosystem approach. What I'd love to know is, I'm sure this was not the case on day zero, right? Uh, talk to us about as a founder, how important is it to figure out where your natural you know, extensions lie and how do you approach that? I'm guessing a large part of this is qualitatively trust winning the customer and then having enough confidence to go into ancillary things. But how do you manage the focus of the org and things like What happens is when you are building a business, you can't start with just one core offering because if that fails, then what happens is you are pretty much exposed. So when we started, we had a bit of off business and a bit of oxyzo to begin with, okay. right? Okay. And it was with a simple funda that if you are going to a customer, if he's not taking your material, at least he'll take financing. So mm -hmm. you hedge that way, right? If you're going to mm -hmm. a customer for financing, if he doesn't, then you, he'll at least take material. Yeah. But so you. But sorry to interrupt. But isn't that again against conventional wisdom of you know 1,000 people to love, focus, all of that? Start with one use case that e works. Yes, but 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 in my opinion. A business is not built that way. In business, mm -hmm. what I, I think the financing guys are supposed to focus on financing. The, the commerce guys were supposed to focus on commerce. But at the end of the day, the business has to deliver on both so that it, does, it is hedged. Mm -hmm. Fundamentally, the enterprise needs to be good on both counts. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how we began. Um, while individual business units were chasing excellence on their own domains. They were not, I mean, the Oxyzo guys were very separate from our business yeah. right from the very start. Absolutely. Right, they were very common. They have very few common resources. So, so I think the way we approached it is that whenever we saw an opportunity within that business, we always tried. Hmm. We never stopped anybody from doing something new because if he said that, hey, I see an opportunity and these are basic core values that I'll take care of, which is profitability, large, scale, it can be large scale, it can be clean, and. Finally, there will be scale. As long as those core values are taken off, whenever we saw an opportunity, we just barged in, yeah. right? And frankly, after having barged in, in I would say 90% of the cases, we realized that there is no opportunity. Mm. What we then did is that we failed very fast. Mm. So because we barged in and failed very fast, there were enormous number of iterations that were happening. But yeah. people were not afraid of taking long-term risks because they knew that the org will scale back pretty quickly if they don't get there. And hence, I think that approach is something that we've retained to even now. Even now, if we see there is an opportunity, we really barge in. Yeah. Got it, fair enough. No, I think that makes complete sense. Uh, the, the other aspect of building a business of this caliber uh, is that there's not enough conventional knowledge about building scalable new age businesses, right? So much of this playbook has to be self-oriented, self-invented. Are there any particular lessons which you feel are helpful in terms of the scaling journey that founders can fundamentally keep in mind on day one that they usually miss out on because of, let's say, not enough foresight? On just scaling, right? Yes. So the first and most important one, in my opinion, is having your core people tied to you. Because I think the real enemy of scaling is is attrition especially with people who are there in the beginning mm -hmm. so you have to make sure that because once there is attrition there is new knowledge to be built there is old knowledge that is got lost and you and you have to acquire it again yeah so for i mean forget scaling for a minute if you have to talk about bridge scaling then your your attrition should be zero especially at the top that's one yeah. uh, the second thing is is work um, workplace satisfaction I think when you are in a, for that matter, in any enterprise, you have to create an atmosphere that when a person is inside, by hook or by crook, he's giving it his all. It mm -hmm. could be because of pressure, it could be because of motivation, it could be because of whatever, because he's too ambitious, but you have to create a, a culture practically where a person literally gives it his all. The way we took it is to say that, hey, you know what, you will grow like leaps, leaps and bounds, Yeah. right? Uh, if your uh, if your friend is getting his first car after four years, here here you will get it in a two year. years in a year. Yeah. If your friend is going to get his first house in ten years, you will get here in two years. 
Yeah. Right? So, so there has to be a way in which you have to design a system where people are giving their all once they're in. Yeah. Now, pressure is obviously the worst way to get it because that may, that may cause attrition, which may touch upon the first principle. But there are other ways to do it. Yeah. Right? Um, the third thing, which I think is very important for scaling, is to understand that there will be one part of your business, and that will be one amongst 10, which will have the potential to become very, very large. And you, as a, as a team member, and maybe as a founder, have to spot that one opportunity. Like, for example, I'll tell you that for us, in commerce and in financing, that one opportunity that we spotted very early was steel. Mm. We said, hey, you know what? We can be really large in steel. We are doing well. It's good money. Our people are learning it fast. Yeah. There are many things happening. But we realized, hey, it'll be steel. I remember, uh, I mean, I write a very frequent blog. I have written at least, I mean, I've written 300 blogs or, uh, or so. Wow. I think 10 of them are on steel. Right? Uh, so, third is to figure out that there'll be always one thing or maybe two things wh which can really, really inflect and to spot that and put all your energies behind that. So that's third. In my opinion, the fourth is you have to choose external ecosystem members very well, whether it is a first investor, whether it is the first lender, you know, whether it is your first few set of customers because they are going to be the uh, mouthpieces for you to bring in the rest. Mm -hmm. I think if you are poor in choosing the first few external members. Internal is still okay, you can play around. There also you will lose out in scale. So I think the those are the kind of things that come to my mind in terms you of it. what you need to do if you have to achieve very large scale. Absolutely. That last one is pretty counterintuitive as well because you know they usually founders talk about internal first members need to be very carefully chosen. You can't make a mistake externally. There you will make a mistake. Yeah. I believe that in people you will always make mistakes. Like I am talked about or uh, members of off business, whether it is Ruchi Kalra, Bhuvan Gupta, you know, all the early founders, we are talked about as great people leaders. But to be very honest with you, I don't think we made such great choices. But we made many choices. Yeah. The real reality yeah. is each of us got in at least 10 people who worked alongside them. And five of them are left. Yeah. Five of them were gone within the first year. But yeah. the five that are left are, are, are the ones that matter. Are what they were in gold. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you don't have to get all right anyway, right? Yes. But in the external ecosystem, you can't do that. If you have three investors coming and joining you in a, you know, in your first mm. deal, if you get one wrong, yeah, you're screwed. Likely, yeah. you get your first lender wrong. Mm. Mm, there is no second chance. Internally, you get a second chance. Very interesting. Great. I think that's going to be a very, very distinctive learning from this one. Um, on the attrition and workplace satisfaction bit, right? While I'm inclined to understand how you do it, maybe let me understand the consequence, which is the wealth generation aspect, right? Now, you've been vocal about the fact that, you know, we've gone out there, we've created incredible benchmarks to create wealth for our employees, and we've achieved that. So you, you know, hold that to pride, and you've done that time and again. Uh, talk to us about, again, two-part answer. One on a macro lens, right? This has not been spoken of enough in the ecosystem where wealth for stakeholders has been created enough or it's not seen or there's enough conversation around. And second is, how did you forward-looking or in the moment ensure it, right? It's okay to now look back and be like, okay, we did this, but it's not as achievable for all founders or does not seem like it. So talk to us about these aspects. No, for me, it was very simple. In my opinion, I think everybody, every stakeholder, whether it is a, whether it is a team member uh, or an investor, or for that matter, anybody, looks for four things in life. The first thing is power. He wants more power. So today, if my power is reducing with age or stage, I would know that I'm not doing that well. I want more power. Yeah. The second is fame. People want to be famous. Yeah. As they grow, as they age, as they stage, they want to be famous. The third thing is money. And the fourth thing is entertainment. So power, fame, money, entertainment. And frankly, if you are aware of these four, the first thing is just about being aware and saying that, hey, everybody needs these. So as long as you are aware of these four, you will end up delivering on likely almost all of them or to mm -hmm. varying degrees in all of them. But if you're aware of these four, you will end up delivering at least all of them, but in varying degrees, right? So, so 
the way I think about it is that when I look at a stakeholder in the ecosystem, I want to give him all four. Certain members want more of the third, which is money. Mm -hmm. Certain members want more of the fourth, like an intern wants more entertainment. Let me put it this way. Yeah. Now, the, I have long debated that should there be knowledge as the mm -hmm. fifth. And I have kind of realized over a period of time that it is not my job to impart knowledge, it is his job to actually take, take knowledge it. from the system. So hence, it's not my job to give him knowledge. So if I'm going and sitting mm. giving gyan, it sounds great in a podcast, but if I'm doing that in, in, uh, in my company, people tell me, what's going on? What's going on? You have to listen to something, you have to listen to some songs, or give me a dance performance. Yeah. You know, people want entertainment. Mm. And if you, there are other forms also you can give, but I've realized over a period of time, it's not my job. They, they'll do that anyways, right? Yeah. But power, I have to give. Today mm. you are leading a team of three, tomorrow five. That's power. Today, you don't have decision-making power. You can probably make approvals only till 5 lakhs. Tomorrow, 50 lakhs that I have to give. Mm. Fame, today, you are known only within the company. Tomorrow, I talk about uh, you. Fame. Fame. I get you in front of a... Uh, yesterday, I was doing a PPT in Master's Union. Today, you are doing it. Fame. Yeah. Money, obvious. Entertainment. People miss out on entertainment because, you know... Enterprise building is a, so much about intensity, so much about hunger, so much about hustle. People miss out on the fact that you have to be a good jocular kind of guy, a great guy to hang out with, yeah. a great guy who can, you know, make parties alive. It's entertainment. You, if you are not able to give it, the system has to give it in some way. System has to create those platforms where people are enjoying themselves. There are frequent outings. You can... Um, you can have uh, recess hours that are entertaining. You can have Good Fridays that are entertaining, some form of the other. Yeah. But as long as you are delivering on this four, I think you've delivered a complete workplace. Mm -hmm. A workplace that is devoid of any of these will likely not be great. And it has to be such that not only it is being delivered, but it is also being perceived as delivered. Mm -hmm. Almost everybody has to know yeah. that the company not only gave me power, fame and money, but also gave me entertainment. Yeah. I came and laughed. I went back hearty. It may be because of a joke that I heard in the washroom. Yeah. It may be because of a poster that was hung out on the cafeteria. But I but laughed. Yeah. So first is just being aware that, you know, these are the four things and it's very common. And you can't clutter it. You can't make it, ten, you can't make it a word cloud. Yeah. Right? And people realize this over a period of time. I think when I started off in the startup ecosystem, I used to think that money was the only one. And soon I realized it's not just money, it's also power. Yeah. That was my second learning. My third learning was fame. And now I realize, actually after people have made all three, they look for entertainment. Because beyond a point, all three don't matter. Mm. They want to have a fun day. So true, so true. Amazing, I love that framework. Um, interestingly, as you were telling this, right, a lot of the learnings that you've had or a lot of the structures you have in place seem to be decently well thought of or original as well. Uh, talk to us I'm about... a good sales guy. Yeah, maybe that. So that's <laughs> what I'm coming to. How much of what you practice is borrowed versus original? And for the original frameworks that you have, be it value, structure, frame, like decision-making decision frameworks, how do you conclude on that? Do you have a process which is strategic enough for it? Uh, uh, mine is not strategic, but very execution-oriented on that. Okay. So what happens, so 99% is borrowed, let me be okay. honest. Fair okay. enough. So what happens is, you know, I, I kind of hear something interesting, or I read something interesting, or I see something happening that is interesting. I kind of, the way I imbibe it, is that I practice it. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, I'll give you one, one clear example from today. Okay. I heard somebody say that, hey, you know what, I like your business, because the business is about India's GDP and not about India's GDP per capita. Because if it is about India's GDP per capita, you're betting on growth. Mm. And the growth may come, may not come in the long term. But if it's about India's GDP, India is already a large GDP, India is the fourth largest GDP in the world. If you're taking a part of that GDP, I thought it was a great analogy. Yeah. This is the fourth time in the day I'm using it. And because it, it is so much, that I've used, what happens is that in my mind it becomes a pattern. Yeah. And when I'm probably half asleep, I'll start thinking about it and add a little bit of a layer of my own thinking around it so that it doesn't sound borrowed. Yeah. And then I use it tomorrow. Yeah. It looks a little different. 
and then it becomes my own statement so the it. reality is that perception is that almost everything is original 99% yeah. original but to be very honest 99% is borrowed yeah this night thought in the example that you used how much of that is very structured in nature like do you program for the initially it was forced okay. but after having done it a few period it's times practice. and it's practice it's behavior uh, huh? uh, more than behavior now when i started seeing success it became first entertainment <laughs> you know Fair. i used to do this it works let me do it more often uh, let me do it more often and uh, also do it in front of the person who gave it to me and i see <laughs> a uh, you know smirk on his face and yeah yeah, yeah i know I li- uh, he likes it i like it so it, then it turned into entertainment then became a habit nice nice lovely i think that's interesting the other connected thing right and this is something i often ask founders because i am pretty fascinated by it but i feel founders have to do these three things simultaneously one is act second is constantly absorb and the third is reflect right you have to do all of these three things almost in parallel right which seems like a tall ask because it's difficult to excel in one let alone all three have you ever thought about this and if yes how do you program for it how do you so not action? thought about it the exact same way okay um but i believe yeah. that the 14 hours of work that you have to do in the day you have to just act the balance 10 is for absorption and reflection okay. what you can do along with action in the 14 hours is basically to you know just take thing and put it in your storage bin not really absorb it yet you can still do your sifting in the storage bin much later but i think that 14 hours is just about running mm. right um during that time whatever you've taken as data in the balance 10 hours you can absorb you can reflect because then you're not in action and that's when you are really efficient and effective about it Got so it. so that's how i think i think fundamentally the moment it has the clock struck as uh, strikes 8 to the time the clock strikes 10 or maybe to the time it strikes 11 with the yeah. breaks in between and all that yeah. you should be in action mode everybody should be in action mode not yeah. the, may, maybe you're not running around maybe you're not you're not working all the time but you're at it but you are at it you are at yeah. the goal you are not trying to refine or define the goal yeah I love that. I think the re-emphasis on the fact that execution, short-term results matter, and that's the only thing that will, in the short run, count, and that will grow, is amazing, right? I mean, yeah. bunch of things. I, I'm a good example for you. I was born with no <laughs> talent. It's not a joke. I was born with zero talent. I remember evaluating myself when I was seven or eight compared to what I used to see in the class, and yeah. I, I, I really thought I had no talent. <laughs> and I'm being very objective. I had no talent, but mm-hmm. then it was all execution. it was all execution i'm and not that bad right so <laughs> yeah yeah not that bad at all <laughs> that's incredible cool i think as we conclude on a couple of things i'd like to go back to that earlier trail of you know uh, the team right there are some distinctive factors about what of business has done uh, which really stand out and some that come to mind the management trainee a uh, program the fact that you do a very i think a monthly town hall if i'm not wrong there are other things as well right there's an abc rule all the other things package that there's into a sunday one, blog package that yeah the sunday blog is your personal i think i look out for that uh, as well package that into one right if you had to give us five unique things that of business has done to maintain culture or to just like succeed right what are those <sighs> good question so um, th- first and most unique thing is uh, is dissemination of information okay so at of business information is not power information is commodity everybody knows what is happening in the company and it is by design mm-hmm. whether it is the sunday blog whether it is frequent emails whether it is all the newsletters monthly newsletters the monthly town hall monthly town hall we actually declare our pnl results by bu by regions every single month with at least 1500 people on the call right so dissemination of information i think a lot of our old age businesses while they have lots of pluses they have this one big minus that they will actually keep information within a certain set of people and that information becomes power mm-hmm. and the reason people are powerful in the information is because they are, uh, in the organization is because they are closer to that information we don't do that we believe in the world of google information is a commodity yeah either you already know it or you just search for it right so if you send out an email you get an answer almost everybody is programmed to be like that so that's mm-hmm. one dissemination of information and hence a lot of these events that you spoke about actually are on on that theme yeah 
the second thing is about empowerment what you will see in of business if you go inside the company you will see that almost everything or maybe 90% is actually led not led by the top 20 guys in the company so if it's a town hall it's led by somebody else if it's an event it's led by somebody else right so hence empowerment of the next layer mm -hmm. so the middle layer thinks the layer after it the founders think the smt the smt thinks as senior management team senior management team thinks about the layer middle layer the middle layer thinks about the bottom layer so everybody thinks that the next level should be empowered mm -hmm. so that is second the third thing which is very unique about us is learning on the job we don't have very long and I'm, i'm happy to be in the masters union campus they have a lot of this you told me that they have a lot of um courses that have a lot of field work mm -hmm. right and practical learning i believe that there is no better learning than learning on the job right um so we believe that learning on the job reflecting on that frequent feedbacks between each other even from a junior to a senior or from a different department to another is something that should be almost common place and not be either frowned upon or be uh, taken joy in right so you will see that there's a lot of feedback loop system that is actually very common within the organization and a lot of events that you spoke about are designed right. towards that okay the fourth thing that we have done in the organization is to say that it will all be about growth so when everybody asks what what will i get in our business we say growth now he asks growth in what we say growth in power growth in fame growth in money growth in entertainment right so so growth so uh, growth is a thing that everybody likes nobody likes stagnation nobody likes to you know shrink in size so if you look at all our town halls and all that not only will it talk about our past performance it will also tell you how we'll grow into the next big one in this month right mm. because it's a monthly town hall yeah right a lot of it is about growth in the short term that's how we evolved the growth one right yeah. i think the fifth thing that we've done uniquely within of business is to say that we will not um you know we will not um make people actually evolve so we don't want people to be in the same roles for years together mm. we want people to try out different roles if you're in sales try out marketing if you're in sales you try out operations if you're in operations try out some general management you maybe try data and all that we want people to experience all kind of other stuff unlike other organizations who tend to bucket you into one function because that's when the organization derives best out of you uh for for uh, for the organization's interest what we believe is that in the early years one should experience very many things so that he can take the call and the organization can take the call after a bit of iteration as to what he's good at in the early years after that you can specialize so so my advice to any youngster who asks me that you know should i be doing something different from what he is doing right now given that he is probably succeeding in what he is doing right now is always to say that hey do something different but maybe you'll be better at it in that right so so i think we embody that in of business so you'll see a f lot of frequent department churns within the organization you will see people changing regions people changing different roles and all that in the early stages in the first 0 to 3 years of their career so i think that's very unique to us i learned Quite. that uh, in one of my previous employers and i really really liked about it but my previous employer was actually the entire organization was designed for that it was essential to their core existence which was a management consulting firm but uh, but i liked that uh, and we've kind of implemented it that's phenomenal i think each of those has a deeper meaning to it and i love the you know practical application of it as you've shared as well um as we go on to conclude right uh, i think i have a set of similar questions that i ask most founders on the show um one of them uh, is uh, how do your friends describe you and how do your employees describe you if this is a different trail <laughs> my 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 friends are all ofbians i think uh, <laughs> <laughs> so so they're pretty much the same uh, maybe some early friends yeah i think early friends will tell you that he's very hungry that's the first objective that will come that okay. he is really really hungry okay love uh, that i think the counter to that the first thing that my uh, current teammates will tell me is that uh, he's very articulate uh, mm. right he can put things in uh, in a form that is uh, 
both understandable as well as disseminable. Understandable is when they understand it. Disseminable is when they can take it and give it. Mm. Right. So I think the first ob adjective that they'll use is articulate. Uh, if you um, if you allow me a second, please. I think my friends will say that uh, he's a, he's a mutant. I I had that nickname when I was a kid, um, meaning that he's very different from us. Uh, right, uh, mm. very different in many respects and all that. So uh, they okay. still think so, uh, that mutant, because my way of thinking was very different, right? I was born to Brahmin parents who were both academicians and I used to think dhanda first, when, even when I was a kid, right? So, um, so mutant. Uh, I think the second thing that my people will tell me, my current team members will tell me is that I am very, very commercial. For me, the, the world runs on uh, the currency of money. Lovely. So hungry and mutant, which is different, and commercial and articulate. Interesting. I think we've covered three out of those. We've not covered hungry as much. So maybe let's double click on that very quickly. And even before we started, you said that you are hungrier than ever, right? Now. It's increasing with age. Yes. The, the interesting part there is, do you think success feeds hunger? Or is it the other way around? Do you think hung, like success can make you less hungry? Or does it only make you more hungry because you've tasted what it feels like? I don't think like that. I, I think success can both kill hunger as well as make you hungry. Okay. It works differently for, I mean, you can probably get complacent mm -hmm. or you can get turbocharged because you think that the, that the next level is just uh, there for you, right? So failure also works both sides. Right. Failures are the stepping stone to success. Failure can demoralize, demoralize. you. I think hunger feeds hunger. Mm -hmm. So if you're hungry, you'll just get hungry, <laughs> hungrier with time. If you are not getting hungrier with time, you're likely not hungry to begin <laughs> with. What's fulfilling then? What, what feeds into hunger? What's your end objective? I understand that for founders, this is a moving goalpost, all of that, right? Every successful person will tell you it's about that next thing. So I understand that hungry is a process, it's flow, but where does it like lead to? I don't know. To be honest with you, I think hunger keeps growing. And maybe when you stop breathing, you see it in the <laughs> next generation of professional or personal uh, sites. I think it, it is a never-ending uh, cycle. It's a never-ending pursuit. It gets passed through generations. Um, there are reasons why it may get curtailed. Mm. Uh, but I, I can't think of anything that will actually stop it for me. Because I'll tell you my example, which I was telling you just before we started. I'm 42. I think I was half as hungry when I was 32. Because I, when I was 32, I liked some moments of leisure. And now, now I don't. <laughs> uh, and I am way more hungry, or maybe four times more hungry when, than when I was 30, uh, when I was 22. Because then I was in also in the pursuit of leisure, along with the pursuit of many other things, right? So, yeah. Um, so yeah. And I'm pretty sure this is going to grow with time. Love it. I think that's a that's an interesting way to look at it for sure. Um, in terms of excellence, we started there, right? So I want to understand that for somebody who's excellent at what they do, they also want to keep on taking that next thing where they can excel, right? Right. You are currently at a position where you're leading a some X valuation company, right? And this will grow till a point, then it'll become public. What is that aspiration? This is connected to the hungry part, right? What is that next big aspiration that you feel that you can excel but are not currently doing? Well, for me, again, it is in short steps. Okay. So, for example, I think I, I remember my previous podcast was with Raj Shamani. Hmm. Uh, and I was telling him that my aspiration is to create a $100 million PAT company. PAT company. Yes. That's how the podcast uh, begins, Began. right? It was, about, uh, it was about five months back, six months back. Yeah. Um, December-ish. Yeah. December-ish. FY24, which is the year we are in, will be way above $100 million PAT, right? Way above. Mm. So for me, my aspiration is what we will do within a year. Okay. Because I'm pretty sure, or maybe two years at most. Yeah. Um, I've heard you say you don't ever plan beyond two years. Or two years is a business plan. A lifetime. <laughs> uh, yeah. Business plan I always make for the current year. I never do it for yeah. two years, right? So, um, so my aspiration is my business plan for the current year and to beat it black and blue on the mm. professional side. Yeah. My aspiration is if I look around people for me, I have personal ambitions for each one of us 
my way better half ruchi kalra i want to do certain uh, i want her to do certain things in this year but that's the aspiration i'm pretty sure it'll get done and i'll have <laughs> a aspiration again so i don't Lovely. have really a very largish you know it's again that compounding that philosophy of kaizen yeah yeah right i come back to that one uh, lovely no that's great i think uh, reinforces the beliefs uh, we usually like we spoken about the reflective things about your strengths your actions the company if you had to be not exactly prescriptive but somebody who's in the ecosystem people look up to you because you've now established a point of success and it keeps growing somebody who angel invest supports young founders what are you know day one things that you will try to reemphasize for young founders building and looking at the show that's one and for two who people who are wanting to become founders because they see a lot of founders like you on the other side there's a lot of fame coming to it there are good and bad aspects to it right what do you think about that so one is for founders who are starting up and the other is for aspirational founders founders who've already started up uh start with people okay uh the first p uh, start with people your build, your business will be built by people <laughs> it may be it may get enabled by tech it will get turbocharged with money but people will build it so be people first uh, the second p care for paisa the world runs on currency of money uh, it is true uh, so care for paisa initially cash flow uh, then about profits then about free cash flow whatever it is it has to be built with paisa and the third is about process have a process to everything don't try to be too jugadish don't try to you know be in the moment and try to do stuff that seems right then have a process because process is scale uh, being in the you know in the proactive mode and uh, mode and trying to create processes which can make things stable able and scalable are things that are important to think in the beginning that everything has to have a process everything has to have a sop a very well defined sop so i would say those three um, uh, are important for people who've kind of taken the leap um, for people who've not taken the leap aspiring founders take the leap <laughs> and start perfect. thinking about those three great i think that's that's perfect for the last question ashish and this has been a pleasure it's been more than what i would have imagined and i was looking forward to this Thank in you my for kind words. most uh, honest self i think this is going to be a bit stereotypical but i'd love if you can give me a vulnerable honest uh, you've been honest but a more vulnerable answer to this right uh, considering that it's now going to be 8 years to have built of business if you could go back to that day one compress this journey and maybe not repeat a couple of things what are those things and what would you tell yourself well many things many Please. many things i think the first thing that i wouldn't do is uh, i think we we really started off quite quickly and we got off the ground very well and then we started trying many many things i think the number of experiments that we picked up at the fag end of our first year of uh, of business uh, was too much in hindsight i would probably do 20% of it so that's one i think we picked up too much too soon i mean almost everything failed mm -hmm. uh, financing is something we picked up in the second year and after having picked up so much which didn't which didn't fire we picked up only one thing in our second year that was financing mm. and it picked up and yeah. picked up well yeah, right up how, yeah. so uh, one is not pick up too many things and i think second would be i did not realize the value of entertainment mm. i realized it only within of business maybe in the third or the fourth year that people not only look for power fame and money in my most intense self i used to say power fame and money delivered done dusted Yeah. I realized later no people look for entertainment especially the ones who have all three yeah. so if i look at ruchi who's accomplished all three of them all early in her life even before coming to our business or for that matter bhuvan gupta or nitin jain i mean they they were fairly accomplished guys when they came in our son shridhar they were looking for entertainment as well I, i didn't realize that i i would change that i would have been a much more i would say uh, less intense less kind of you know demanding kind of guy because it didn't take me anywhere Fr frankly if i kind of 2020 hindsight but frankly when i think of it i think what i gained through that i gained some mm. i lost more mm. i lost some good friends mm. i lost some good times mm. uh, i lost some black hair 
yeah. I grade quickly. So I yeah. think I, I realized the value of entertainment <laughs> very late <laughs> in life, in mm. our business life as well. So that would be second. If you allow me a third. Please. I think I realized the power of, you know, I used to initially think what you asked, which is that the power of innovation has to come from people at the top. Mm. That also I realized very late. Mm. Now, what I spoke to you is my understanding of today, which is that the innovation has to come from ground up, has to come from the middle layer and all that. Yeah. I realized that later. Mm. I realized that, you know, when, 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 I, when I was done with my ideas, I was done with Ruchi's ideas, I was done with Nitin, Bhuvan, J uh, Vasant, Pratyush, these were our initial guys, right? Their ideas. When we were done and we looked out, we saw very many ideas and they yeah. were really much better. Yeah. I, I think if that wisdom especially through my own experience would have come earlier. Damn. We would have been a much bigger, larger, more profitable and much more scaled company. Lovely. I think those three pointers are incredible. It'd be a great point to end, but I actually want to double click on the entertainment part, right? Right. Very quickly, in your understanding of, you know, let's say outlier success, do you think it is important at least for a couple of years to have that one dimensional view of we have to crack it either way and not look at anything else, which may not have a component of entertainment. Or do you think, you know, things like balance have to exist and thus entertainment becomes a crucial factor? So for me, it's the 14-10 rule, 14 hours, all action. Ten hours you can avoid that uh, in the first two years. Hmm. Um, you can avoid entertainment in those 14 hours in the first two years. But um, you have to have it in the other 10. After two years... You have okay. to have it in the Bake 14 as well. Got it. I think entertainment is a, is a key thing why people get energized on job while at it. And that kind of enhances both efficiency as well as effectiveness. Correct. So key to workplace yeah. satisfaction. It's a source of maybe motivation, energy, and it helps turbocharge the performance. Think about it. If your boss is actually intense all the time, he's kind of yeah. asking for reviews, updates, he's also working very hard. When you are like going out at 8 p.m., you kind of look at him and he's like, oh, into his computer. <laughs> Versus yeah. there is a waft of light music playing at 7 p.m. Yeah. Huh? Feels very different. Yeah, yeah. Now, as I said it out loud and heard you, I think that started to make more sense. But lovely. I think this has been incredible. I think... We've covered a bunch of things, a, a variety of your principles about the company, how and what has changed and how the business functions. Kudos to all that you do and thank you for being a source of inspiration to so many of us. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, you're doing a great job of uh, having shifted from audio to video. Do more of that and uh, we'll love to participate in some other form as well. Thank you Lovely. for having me. Thank you so much, Ashish. Thank Pleasure. You.